So a common issue a lot of people have is when traces rip on circuit boards. So for example, this is a select pad of a Game Boy Advance. Typically when you're doing screen mods, you'll use the select button. And when you've got a wire soldered like this and you accidentally tug, it's very easy to rip this connection off. So we can see here the connection is torn off, the pad's missing. So the question then comes, once this happens, how do we assess what damage has gone on and how we repair this damage? It's pretty simple uh, when you think about what a circuit board is. So if we look at the circuit board in front of us, we have a few layers. So in the middle of the board, right here, we have an insulator. So in modern PCBs, this is usually fiberglass, but it's basically something that doesn't conduct electricity in the middle of the board. Then on the top of that, say here, there's a layer of copper with your traces on. And then above that, there's the paint, the silk screen, that is the green and white layers. On the bottom, there's similar. You've got your insulation in the middle here, then you've got your copper traces, and then you've got your sort of paint layer. So if we look at this board and try to think of it that way, you'll see this gold here. You'll have copper under this gold. Most circuit boards are gold plated. So you'll see under here, you'll see the copper revealing itself under the gold plating. But this is effectively the conductive layer, the place where all the traces run. So if we take a look at this circuit board area here, for example, and you can clearly see this kind of green wire and this dark green area. So what is that? The dark green is simply where there's no copper. So what you have is the insulator underneath and then green paint, what's called solder resist, that hides that. When there's copper on top of the insulator, obviously copper and gold plating is brighter. So you will have copper under here and then the exact same green paint over the top, but it gives a visual difference. So you can see effectively through the paint to what's underneath. And when it's a lighter color, typically, it's you're seeing copper. And when it's a darker color, there's simply no copper there. There's nothing conducting. So you can kind of see the traces under the paint layer. When you see pads like this, you can see the light green area there and the dark green area here. The light green is obviously copper. And so this pad is connected to this light green area here. And then the dark green is no copper. So let's take a look at the TP2 pad and figure out what's going on and how we repair this pad. You can see something's missing and it's hard to tell because we've got all this kind of paint over the top to visually impair our view. So what helps in this situation when you can see clearly there's a pad missing, I know it goes to this green trace here, this light green trace just to the right. And then you can see it goes up here. It also goes down here, swerves along, comes down here, through, down, through, down, and makes its way to this pad here. But because of this white silk screen, which is just another paint layer on top of the solder resist layer, so you have one paint layer here in green to insulate from electrical conductivity, and then you have an identification layer on top, which is typically white, which is used to print the names of things. So you've got this, when it's on the very top, it's called a silk screen, and that's because they use silk screen technology to put enamel paint on. And then you've got this solder resist layer, which is electrically insulating to protect pads and things from touching. So because there's such a heavy layer on here, it's very hard to see through this board to kind of trace where that goes. So depending on what board you're working on, what you might find helpful is to firstly get schematics to find out where things should go. And we can kind of backtrack then as to what we're expecting things to do. The other option that sometimes help is to grab a fresh board that isn't damaged and then look at the board to see where things should go. And you can see here, this has already been scratched by somebody as well, but you can see this clearly connects to here. But then when you go down, you still have the same kind of problem trying to trace where this goes under this white paint. So we can do this on its own with just this board, but what might help and what is beneficial to look for is schematics. So if you go to retro6.wiki and then public files, and this is a list of all our retro6 public files, into schematics and data sheets, and then into GBA. You can find many more schematics here and useful information. And if we just open up the GBA schematic, we can look around this schematic and find what we want. So what we have is the select button. So you can see the select button here. And you can see, this is a fairly poor schematic, but you can see this is a ground symbol 
kind of indicating that two pads on the select are joined and go to ground and that two other pads join around and then make the way to pin 126 of U1 which is the CPU which you can kind of just tell when you start looking at things you can see this is the main chip in the middle and other things around it so you'll get used to reading schematics and I can explain that further in another video but the important thing here is we know you can see here TP2 is clearly a test point number two and it's attached to this wire of the select so TP2 is simply touching on what should be one of the select pins it should also go to pin 126 of the CPU so what you can do is take the working board first because it's always good to start with a working board if you have it. If you don't, it's not the end of the world. You're just gonna have to make an assumption that what you're thinking is right. But there's nothing better than having an actual working board to test. So based on what we know on that schematic, we put our multimeter into continuity mode. TP2 should be connected to either these two outer ones or this inner one. We also know that from the schematic, the select pads for the other one should be ground. So we can do a process of elimination. Basically, one of these should be ground. So you can see these two are connected and this is obviously one trace. So if we go on the outer one and touch ground, you can see the outer two are the ground pads, the inner one must be therefore this other trace. So there's TP2, we expect to touch pin 126 of the CPU, as well as this pad here on select. So you can see it's good there, it touches there, and does it touch pin 126? And if you want to be lazy, instead of counting pins, just hold the multimeter on TP2, gently drag down, and find where it beeps. Once it beeps, you can go more precise, and sort of pin out a specific pin. And we can see it is the third pin from the bottom on here. You can also see it's written, pin 103, pin 128, and the dots you'll find are five pin indicators. So pin, like say this is a pin number, you've got one, two, three, four, five pins between each dot. So it kind of helps you count quickly. You don't really see that on modern silk screens anymore, but on the older ones, they tend to do that. So we know we have an electrical connection from select to the CPU, which is the important thing. But we also have it to TP2. TP2 is just a test point. So if this pad rips off and doesn't break this trace, there's no real issue. You just don't have a test point anymore. So if we take that knowledge and look at this broken trace, we can't test TP2 because it's missing, but we can at least test, does select still make contact with the CPU? And it does. So that must mean that the trace is intact and good to use. So there's nothing to repair on the trace, but if we wanted to solder a point now, we'd have to either solder to select, solder to the actual pin on the circuit board, or we'd have to expose some of the trace to solder to. I'll also show you when I break the trace on purpose how to repair the trace. But let's just take a look at this trace now. And we want to really see where this trace goes. But you can see on modern circuit boards, such as a switch, the traces are really easy to see. You just basically follow them around. However, on the Game Boy, they decided for whatever reason to cover half the board in this enamel paint making it very difficult to see where the traces are. And as always, it's always best to use all the tools you have at your disposal. So what we could do is scrape away all of this paint until we see the copper and try and follow it. But that's gonna make a mess of this one circuit board. Instead, you can have board scans. So I've already scanned this circuit board in the top and bottom layer, but I haven't yet stripped all this coating off to show you the copper. However, many other people have online and if you just search for GBA board scan, you'll come across, I think the top link is this bitbuild.net. And you can find this awesome little strip down view. So if we close this, you'll see it's got the board scans like I've got the board scans. It's got components on, no components on. And then all this is, is they've sanded off all of this green and white layer. So all the paint off this top layer then reveals this copper underneath. And that's the layer we're talking about. So if we just zoom in on this, we can now nice and clearly see there's test point two and it comes across down through into the select pad here it also goes up around through and it's now the second trace in this line at the moment squiggles around and comes to that third pin on the cpu there 
So knowing that, and this is the usefulness of having a stripped down board view, we know we need to basically attach solder to somewhere. Now, if this trace is intact here and I want to attach a new wire, I'd try to find the thickest point possible that isn't going to interfere with function. So if you solder on this pad here, this is going to be the actual button that is functional where the rubber touches down. So you're going to make a mess of this pad. So you don't want to solder here. However, this is a nice thick trace here running off until it goes thin. So instead of trying to reveal this trace here, I would find this trace and attach a wire here if I wanted to make a point. So if we were to do that, you can see it kind of comes out of here and just reveals itself through this letter T and going up. And then it wiggles around, comes up here, and then it gets thin right about here where we saw. So we can pick, say, this point right here and expose this out. So let's just do that. And you can use tweezers, you can use this grinder tool we sell on our store, or you can use anything you have at your disposal, really. Just don't go too hard or too deep because you'll cut straight through the copper layer and then you'll have another repair job on your hands. Clean that with IPA and you can see the trace exposed there. So first thing to do is test if this trace is actually the trace we want. So how do we do that? We simply check it has continuity on the multimeters to the pad we want. And continuity just means it's joined together. So if we go on this pad here, is this the right trace? Yes, it is. And you can see, say this one, if we went to this one, it's not the right trace. This one isn't the right trace. This one isn't. So you know when it beeps, that's the trace we want to attach to. So if we wanted to attach a wire to that, now we simply add some solder and attach a new wire. But for example's sake, normally what happens when people rip these pads is they don't just rip the test point off here. What they normally do is this. They normally rip clean through the circuit. So you can see there, circuit's been destroyed. You can also see a little bit of loose trace there sticking up. So it's important to clean off when you see damage. Just dig back and clean off until you have fresh copper revealed with nothing floating. So let's presume this is what you did when you pulled the trace off. Let's go back to testing and we get our multimeter. Let's go on to select and let's go to the CPU. So we now go to select and touch over the CPU pins. You can see we now have a broken trace. There's no longer a connection from the select pad to the CPU. And that's because it's ripped here between the line. So what's happened is this area of copper here has been completely destroyed and the path going from here to here has simply been disconnected. So this is then a damaged trace that we need to physically restore. So let's take a look at how to restore that trace now. So how do we repair this trace? So we know from testing that this point travels up through here, through this bit here that's broken, that then carries on up. So the ultimate goal is to restore connection from the select pad here, which is the end point, the physical function of the button, to the CPU leg. So if this board was really damaged, this trace had ripped all the way off, your ultimate goal is you need a wire from here to the third pin down here. Now we know this trace is good following it along, we know it's good up to here. So we only really need to repair the smallest gap um, or whatever the easiest repair is. If this was like a nice big pad like this and this was a big pad, you could send a nice big wire easily if you didn't fancy you know, a, a harder soldering job. So it's not necessarily about the shortest path, it's about what works for you. But what we can do is test that, for example, the break above here, we know should go to the pin up here, which it does. And that the break below that trace should go to here, which it does. So we know we have effectively this pad that we need to connect is here, and this pad that we need to connect is here. And we know that because we did the damage yourself in this case, but that's how you'd prove where it is that you want to solder to. So knowing this, we need to be able to solder and bridge these gaps. So the best way to do that is with enamel wire. So this is really thin wire. You can see how thin this wire is. And it's got a coating as the name suggests of enamel. So it's a copper wire, a single core with enamel coating. 
So it's not actually conductive. So if we got the testers, for example, and touched on here and touched on here. You'll see there's no beep, there's no connection because this has got an insulative enamel coating. So even though it looks like bare copper, it's not. So the goal of this is we'll lay this in line with where the trace has been destroyed. So like that, and we'll solder this wire in place of the trace. So let's just see how to do that. The first thing we need to do is to expose the copper underneath the silk screen. So underneath the paint. So we basically need to remove the paint layer. So we'll do this carefully with the grinding tool. We'll reveal more of this trace going up. And it's important to try not to remove the copper either side, the paint from either side to expose the other traces. You're trying your best to only expose the area you want to solder to. And the reason for that is when you come to do your new solder, you don't want to bridge points. So we can see here that we have this little bit of floating copper there. So you see how it keeps wanting to touch this other trace and this trace is already exposed. So we've got to be careful we don't bridge this trace because it's not the same pad, it's not where we're going. So now we can see that nice and clearly. We've got everything exposed. We want to take our soldering iron, get some solder, and you want to what's called tin these traces. So you want to apply solder onto these traces so that it turn into a nice solder blob like that. Now if you've exposed the traces well enough, it will happen very easily like we've just seen. If you haven't exposed enough of the paint yet, then you'll get more like uh, what this part is here, this kind of light silver that hasn't really made a ball. What you're looking for is this nice big ball of solder. So this is the trace prepped. What we do to prep, or at least what I do to prep enamel wire, is I simply take my soldering iron and apply some solder. Nice big ball. And then I just simply pass in the enamel wire and leave it inside the ball for like a second and then go up. And you can see what I'll have done is removed that enamel coating. So you can now see the enamel coating's kind of rolled back up and the copper has been tinned with our solder. So now we can use this end to do the repair. So to do the repair, we want to put a little bit of flux on the area. And I wouldn't worry, you can't really ever have too much flux as so long as you just clean it up after. We want to line this up in line with the actual trace and blob the iron over. And you can see this one is secured. And then we can bend this into a position that works for us that isn't touching anything else. And you can see if we remove that exposed pad, you can see there it's caught here on the solder. So if you tack to remove it, you can see it comes off easy. And let's just show you that once more. You basically place the wire in line. Tap on with your iron like that. Bend this into line to follow the trace. And if you want to keep it in place while you're warming up, you can just place your tweezers over the top like that and warm up. And you can see I'm exposing more copper doing this. But you can see why I pre-strip the enamel wire first, because if you do it this way, you'll get the enamel under your trace here so it doesn't quite make a cleaner joint but either way that's kind of showing you both ways of doing it and you just tend to try and follow the trace as best you can because you never know if it's a high speed line and the trace length matters once you know it's secure this wire is that thin that you won't rip anything doing it you can actually wiggle this and instead break the wire and if you want to then cut this trace just get sort of a flat implement this is just a, a screen pry tool and just press on just below where it's soldered, just gently to indent the enamel wire, and then bend the wire a few times to break it.
and you'll find that wire comes off and what we're left with is hopefully a repaired trace that doesn't bridge any of the other gaps so we know what we want to be careful of is this via here that's really close this via here and this trace here so while they're where they are we can actually test that so continuity testers put one pad here one on this via here and there's no beeping one on this via here no beeping and then one on this trace here no beeping so we know we don't have a short between the things in the area and now if we test the important thing we should have now a connection from here to destination which we do so that's how you restore a trace when it's broken and the important fact is to simply find out where the trace should have gone either by visually inspecting where the trace has got a break and then finding out where the other sides go to ultimately because if a trace is broken you don't really want to have to repair directly over a trace if you don't have the tools or the skill level you want it to go back to ideally a nice big pad like this or one of these pads here so say a trace broke here and this was too thin for you to solder but comes back to this pad here you can just solder a wire to here instead so you want to make your life as easy as possible to where your skill level fits but this is a very common issue that people have where they rip pads off and this is how you repair them if you have any questions or you want to see more repair videos like this just let me know and hopefully that's taught some people how to identify and fix a trace regardless of whether you know where it goes or not by simply testing where the wires go as well as seeing what the actual circuit board is made of a fiberglass layer the copper layer the gold plating and then two layers of paint the solder resist and then the silk screen and then obviously components soldered on after that once you kind of demystify what's under all this paint it becomes a lot easier to simply understand that you're just looking at traces of copper under a circuit that make a physical connection from a to b and you need to simply repair that bridge just bear in mind some traces go multiple directions and you could have some instances where a trace rips and it's actually going to two different routes and you need to restore the original functionality and repair both routes but ultimately the way you repair them is identical you just find out where they went bridge them with wire or go from destination to source that's it for this one and i'll catch you in the next